listening to Pop Health Week on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm Greg Masters, Managing Director of Health Innovation Media, the publisher of ACLWatch.com, and your Pop Health Week co-host with my partner and co-founder, Fred Goldstein, President of Accountable Health, LLC, a Jacksonville, Florida-based consulting firm. Our guest today is Cliff Frank, President of Healthcare Management Solutions, a managed care consulting firm located in Dunedin, Florida. He has more than 30 years of healthcare experience working with payers, hospitals, IPAs, PHOs, and clinically integrated networks with demonstrated abilities in managed care contracting, provider-payer relationships, bundled payment design, capitation, program design and management, accountable care design and operations, and evaluation of managed care models and structures. Throughout his career, Cliff has focused on reducing waste and enhancing quality for the benefit of patient care, creating clinical and financial alignment among providers and payers has been a central theme for his professional work across a variety of settings and organizations. So, Fred, over to you. Help us get to know Cliff. Thank you so much, Greg. And Cliff, welcome to Pop Health Week. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. We've known each other for quite a while, haven't we? Yeah, too many decades. <laughs> too many decades is right. You've really been doing, over the years, some fantastic work across healthcare with payment methodologies, new approaches to reimbursement, et cetera. Why don't you give the audience a little background on uh, your history? I've run medical groups. I've run health plans. I've run provider networks. I've been yelled at by everybody, so it's all good. I try to work in that space between payers and providers to try and find ways to create clinical and financial alignment so that the patient gets better care, the doctors and hospitals make a little bit more money, and the plan saves money through enhanced quality and maybe a, a little more prudent utilization of services by the doctor. <laughs> you were one of the earlier birds into this whole thing of capitation and some of those unique concepts and actually published a book, I guess, and empowered ph- physician empowerment through capitation back in the day. Is that right? Yep. Yep. I caught, caught the tail end of that curve. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and part of that tail end was kind of getting whacked, wasn't it? I think, Cliff. Well, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing what we know now that we didn't know then that actually mm-hmm. could make some of these things be uh, much more effective. Like all our stuff about risk stratification and and uh, prospective monitoring of of cases and understanding better how people go to the ER and could go someplace else and how to intervene to, 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 to effectuate that change. I mean, we're just a lot wiser now, but still in the midst of relearning a lot of those, those lessons because it all comes back to uh, data and, and equipping providers to make better database decisions. And if the data is no good, then the decisions are going to be kind of suspect. So it all comes back to getting good, getting good data in, in people's hands. Yeah, so I, you know, I think back to those early days, and I think we first began discussing stuff in the mid '90s when I was at Healthcare USA, and you were over at, at uh, Mission Health and developing some unique programs there. And we talked about globally capitating your facilities and doctors for a Medicare program. Yep. So, yep, that's right. As those struggled in the '90s, and we've now, as you said, come back to it. You just talked about it. Is it really the fact that we didn't have enough? data back then or didn't understand the importance of the data to make those programs successful, and that's what's allowing us to do it now? I, I think we didn't really understand the nature of the variability. I mean, we, we understood the mean cost and the mean utilization, but you start talking about the tail ends of the distribution, and, you know, we were taking full risk naked. I mean, how dumb was that? <laughs> no re you know, no no aggregate reinsurance, no risk corridors, you know, nothing. Just bring it. Okay, we're good. We got cash until until, until the IBNR hits and I say, Oh, what was that? How do you what's that stuff? Yeah. I mean it was terrifying. <laughs> Taking an overall blended rate, right? And not not looking at your population. Yeah, yeah. And, and, well, issues, and, and that's the it, other thing is the programs are different now too, because Medicare is risk adjusting. 
and and Medicaid often is risk adjusted on the premium side. So when you take a percent of premium, you're getting that risk adjustment is flowing all the way through to the to the to the providers. Whereas when you and I first did this, it was a flat number, and if the mix was wrong or if the risk changed, you were stuck. And you talked about it, you know, this variation. And let me first point out, for those who may not know, IBNR is incurred but not reported. But you talk about this variation, and it's really two two issues of variation in clinical variation. One is the variation in your population. You talk about those people on the tail ends of either side. And the other is the variation between physician practices, correct? Well, and that's the, that's the part that's more toxic because it's harder to address. It costs more. And it, uh, and it doesn't go away. So if somebody, if somebody thinks that having a pulse is a reason to do an operation, I mean, they're going to find lots of reasons to do it. And confronting that, that, that doctor about their practice pattern is not something that provider organizations that are accepting risk are really well set up to do. You know, the hospitals are totally conflicted. A lot of the doctors are conflicted. And a lot of them are just scared. They don't want to, they don't want to have that discussion. It, it makes that whole process fraught with ways for people to kind of run away from it. So you jokingly talked about if they have a pulse, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to admit them. And you recently held what are called one of your confabs. Give the audience in, some insight into what a confab is, and then we can sort of dive into that issue that you just raised, which was discussed at that confab. So I've done, I don't know, a half a dozen or more of these meetings of a collection of cronies that I've accumulated over the years of friends and colleagues who I respect and think that, think have a lot on the ball. And so once a year we get together in some place, like New Jersey or Florida or wherever, take over a hotel ballroom with yeah, 30, 25, 30 people, and just work on a concept or a question or a problem and try to kind of get to some common understanding. And these are people who generally are anywhere from filled with strongly held beliefs to downright belligerent. So <laughs> they're, they're always <laughs> sparks. And uh, no one who's shy is admitted, let's put it that way. So it's, it's a lot of fun. But it's, it, what's really interesting in every time I've done this is that what I think is going to be kind of the end result in terms of a what the real problem is or what the real solution is, I'm always wrong because you put 25 smart people in a room and everybody's going to come out with something that's a little different. And by the time you kind of mush it all together, it doesn't look like anything that, that any book where we started from. It, it's, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, it really is. I had the good fortune of thanks for the multiple invites of finally showing up at one of these things. And it, it was obviously well, well worth my time with some great discussion. Oh, by the way, Fred, that'll be the, that, that's your last invite. But yeah, I, just... I, I figured as much. I probably teed off a few people more than you did. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned you bring a diverse group. Talk about, maybe you don't have to mention the individuals who are at these things, although you might if, you, if you'd like to, but sort of their roles and, and, and positions within the industry. Well, since I've worked on all sides of this, from medical groups to provider networks to health plans, I, I haven't been a regulator, but, but most of the other stuff, roles I've done, I bring in people who I like. They could be consultants, they could be actuaries, could be doctors, medical directors, or just real-life practitioners, people who are plan managers, people who are network managers or, provi- or hospital managed care folks. Uh, just, it's a whole diverse group, agents, brokers. Uh, reinsurance uh, brokers. I mean, it's just people from everybody's got a little, a little. It's kind of like the old parad- uh, uh, parable about people feeling the ap- feeling the elephant, and everybody comes away with something uh, starts with something different, and mm-hmm. hopefully by the end we all realize, oh yeah, this is an elephant. Okay, so that's that's kind of how this all starts. Is that that we've got lots of different people with different perspectives, and by the end we don't necessarily have a common perspective, but we have Everybody's been exposed to different perspectives. Yeah, it's really a, a fascinating uh, day and interesting issues. And 
Early on in this discussion, you raised the issue of this overutilization or having providers who are overutilizing and how difficult that is to address. And at this session, you know, the confab I was at a few weeks back, we discussed the issue of these really strong practice groups within a community and having an ACO that you're, that you're operating, which you do now. And how do you try to control the individuals in Medicare so that they do not necessarily go to those facilities because of the utilization and cost issues. It was really a fascinating discussion. You want to touch on that a bit? So the origin of this dilemma that I brought to the group to kind of pound on was that we had a uh, our bonus for one of our shared savings contracts just decimated by 23 people uh, going to the wrong high-cost hospital and getting back surgery. And they went to the they went to a mega orthopedic group, and then getting back surgery at the competing facility at prices which were double or triple what it would have cost at, at the home facility. So that million dollar expense came right about out of our bonus pool. Now, not all million of it, but you know half a million of it was you know market price difference between the two facilities. Of the 23 cases, 20 were self-referred. And we know that because we looked at the claims data and there was no PCP visit within two months prior to that initial specialist visit. So that got me thinking, well, how do we address this? These are, these are ACO patients in a PPO. They can go anywhere they want. Same thing with Medicare. My God, and we're going to take risk for this? Oh, boy. So that was the problem I bought, brought to the group. For me, how I was defining it was, well, maybe we need to kind of intervene in the clinical process earlier to get the patient maybe not going to those orthopedists, but going to the, to the orthopedists that are affiliated with our facility. But that particular group that was drawing these patients is a, is a very powerful and well-known group in, the, in all over South Jersey. And they do good work. There's, there, there, there wasn't, you know, that wasn't really the issue. When I, I, I served this up to, you know, this group of 25, it was pretty quick that people were really jumping on the idea, well, the problem isn't the patient self-referring. The problem is the primary care doctor's not taking enough time to bond with the patient so that the pr patient feels like they really need to have a conversation with the primary care doctor about their low back pain rather than just run off to the specialist. In other words, I was confusing the symptom with the cause. So what people were saying was, well, we need to really look at how we pay and compensate, invest in our patient relationships, because this is a debt, as we move more and more to value-based care, this is a downstream cost, which is coming right out of the primary care doc's pay. So it's kind of like pay me now, pay me later. But this is a cost which is reversible, maybe, if we make the front-end investments, like in the annual wellness visit, you, you talk mm -hmm. to them about, you know, they've got a little bit of knee pain. Okay, well, let's 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 kind of under let's work on this together, kind of stuff, rather than just kind of making a note in the chart and moving on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes quite a bit of sense, and it's interesting in that discussion of how much people thought about, well, how do we influence the patient's behavior versus how much do we influence. You talked about this whole side of the provider and putting more of the onus on the provider to try and solve that problem. I thought it was also interesting as we talked about it when I'd done a little bit of research on that prior to it was this fact that, that CMS had actually or the Office of the Inspector General had actually written something about this and, and one of their solutions was that if you see it and it's really bad, report it to the feds, which I just thought was an unbelievable statement to make, but obviously there may be some truth to that in, in those few providers that may be way out there on the spectrum. Well, when you have somebody running around in vans picking up patients off the street, yeah, that could be a problem for the inspector general. But that's not, that's not the model we're, we're struggling with here. It's more the patients want to go, you know, they get, a can they get an initial cancer diagnosis and boom, they're off to some brand name facility, or you know they got they've got a you know a stomach bug and they self refer to the GI doc who passes them on to you know somebody else who passes them on to somebody else the secondary referral phenomenon and the primary is totally lost 
any idea what's going on with the case. So there are any number of bad things can kind of start with that patient self-referral, but mm-hmm. they have every right to do it under the PPO program in regular Medicare. And if we work with these mega groups to at least make sure we get the PCPs back involved in the conversation, you know, that's one thing that's positive. But to dig deeper, why would a patient just kind of go off on their own? Well, maybe they had a pre-existing connection with that medical group. Okay, well, that's kind of understandable. But if they have so, it and they're just responding to an ad, you know, well, that's, that's kind of scary. Yeah, Cliff, it's – and I, I was going to ask you this because you – Really, you know, like and believe in the ACO model, but it, as you talk about in in particularly Medicare, these individuals can free flow to wherever they want to go for their care, and yep. there's this whole movement towards this idea of how do we how do we align the the revenue model where what are expenses to me are your revenue without. Or can that even be done within an ACO model with those outside providers to try and change that behavior? Or does that point to the need for a more integrated approach? The the fundamental problem with the ACO model is it doesn't allow you to change benefits, change payment methods, or change medical policy. We have absolutely no control of any of that. The only good thing is is that all the sins that are currently committed are in the base rate. So we don't have to fix all those. We just got to tweak them a little bit and suddenly we're in bonus territory. But in terms of kind of attacking the 25 to 40 or percent or more that's waste, there are too many people making too much money off waste in the fragmented system for that to kind of get fixed through a through kind of a, a regulatory process. I think it's really has to be much more an incentive-based process where, you know, we move to some sort of patient-based payment like contact cap or a global fee per K or some other population-based payment method where you don't get more for doing more. You get more for the patient having a successful outcome, however you got there. With that in mind, how do you feel about the new Pathways to Success program? Are you comfortable with that change? I am because it's really actually a pretty good deal for providers, for people who kind of aren't sure of the, the, the change. What Medicare did was they said, okay, no more upside-only deal. Eventually, you've got to get on risk. And the path they, they put us on was actually a fairly – generous path. The first year you're at risk, it's 1% down. So if we've got 10,000 lives and a thousand bucks a month spending target, that's $120 million. So we could lose one in total spend. So we could lose $1.2 million. And they say you can make up to 50% of whatever you save up to a cap of 20%. So we could lose one or we could make 10. That is half of 20. Now, we're not going to save 20, but we could easily save 6, 8, 10%. So 1% down, 10% up. The second year, it's 2% down, 10% up. And the third, fourth, and fifth years, it's 4% down, 10% up. So it's, in other words, it's not a reciprocal distribution. It's skewed in favor of savings over risk. So if you got to get your, you know, your feet wet, by stepping into into the flow, this is a pretty good way to do it. It's a it's a it's it's not it's not without risk. It's definitely got risk, but coming up with a me with one percent is a lot different than having to come up with ten percent. Right, and is this why, as we've discussed before, you feel much more comfortable with this model versus going to say a Medicare Advantage approach? No, actually, I would prefer a Medicare Advantage approach, and you can do both. Lots of organizations do both. The thing about the MA approach is that it's, well, it bifurcates. You've got now Medicare Advantage PPOs, which have exactly the same problems we just described for the ACO. And then you've got the Medicare Advantage HMO that'll do a delegated, uh, that'll do a lot of delegated services. 
like the HealthSpring model and, and some of the other, other models that are out there that are primary care advocate, used to be gatekeeper, driven. And, you know, if it's not referred, it, does, it doesn't get paid. That fixes a whole bunch of things, but it may not sell near as well as a Medicare PPO that covers, covers you no matter what, no matter where, just maybe a little bit more in this place, a little bit less in that place. Our system is so fraught with overburden, extra utilization, that even a Medicare PPO can generate significant returns to a managing primary care physician. Uh, it's, it's incredible. We have a long ways to go, but over time, as that loosely uh, managed utilization tightens up, then the real savings will have to come from managing care and clinical clinical improvements, not just kind of moving the patients to lower cost facilities. So given that, do you see us reaching the point where our net trajectory of higher costs every year flattens out or or actually reduces as that we actually do see some impact on that twenty five percent? Fred, I am not optimistic in that regard for a couple of reasons. One is technology is always expanding, and whatever we think is substitutional ends up being additive, like telehealth or home health or any number of other things that we thought would be substitutional. But sooner or later, as the door opens wider and wider for more and more use, it becomes additive, not substitutional. It's, now, from a qualitative standpoint, it's much better, no doubt. But I am not convinced that suddenly demand is going to either demand is going to go away nor provider-induced demand. What I do think is interesting is the impact of reference-based pricing and how that might disrupt um, a lot of healthcare systems that have been put together to essentially bang on managed, commercial managed care plans for more money. With a re- and this was another concept topic we had that was just fascinating. In a reference-based price, the benefit plan says, we're going to pay X percent of Medicare, and that's it for hospital services, 140, 120, 160, 200, whatever the number is. That's the max we'll pay. And we're going to, we're going to surround the patient with a, with a bunch of lawyers to prevent the health systems from, from suing them, or if they get sued, we'll defend them in court. Those kinds of plans are starting to take off a little bit a little bit more, a little bit, and they're going to hit an inflection point, I think, in a couple of years. Now, I'm always early, so a couple of years for me is probably means it'll be a couple of decades. But I, I still <laughs> think there's, there's um, it's so attractive because at 120, 140 percent of Medicare, when the hospitals are getting 250, 300, I mean, you save a heck of a lot of money. So absolutely, the so what price? obviates the need for a lot of this kind of guerrilla health system aggregation. And so I think somebody, it could, it could if it takes off in say Cleveland or in Memphis or Nashville or whatever, it could really undo a number of these health systems that were pretty loosely put together anyway. And when you're referring to health systems, you're really referring to hospitals, Correct. Hospitals and, and physician aggregated um, clusters, yes. True. So the one concern I have with reference-based pricing, although I think it's a great model, is it, it has to deal with some quality issues, or otherwise you're just going to see a whole lot more of those things being done at a lower price, assuming it still makes a little bit of money well, by I think, the facility. Well, I think you're absolutely right. It does bundle payment and centers of excellence and, and some of these other tactics, including reference-based pricing are kind of skimpy on the question of, is this the right utilization? Just it's done at a price which is significantly lower. Same if we went to Medicare for all. Wait, everything on the hospital would get to be half the price it is today. And in 10 years, you know, the utilization would be above where, I mean, the total cost would be above where they are today because of utilization creep. So, and that's why I like the, the whole notion of having vertically integrated or maybe uh, IPA-driven, but definitely provider risk transfer to, to people who can judge the clinical effectiveness of, of all these different treatments that a patient needs 
to say this is appropriate, this is not necessary in this case, and in this patient, this proposed treatment would be harmful. So we're not going to we're not going to do it. That kind of on the ground, in your face kind of intervention only happens inside at risk provider communities. It doesn't happen with a big bad payer. It doesn't happen with the government. It happens doctor to eyeball other doctors to say this isn't going to work. And for that conversation to happen, people have to be very strongly motivated because those conversations are so hard and, 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 and have lasting consequences. They really do. And with that, Cliff, we're going to have to wrap it up. I hope you can get us information that we can get out about the next confab because it was truly fantastic. And uh, perhaps some of our listeners will show up for that. So thanks so much for coming on Pop Health Week. Okay. My pleasure. Well, back to you, Greg. And thank you, Fred. That is the last word on today's broadcast. I want to thank the seasoned veteran, Cliff Frank, president of Healthcare Management Solutions, Inc., for his time and insights today. For more information or to follow Cliff's work, go to www.cliffffrank.com. For Pop Health Week, my colleague Fred Goldstein and Healthcare Now Radio. This is Greg Masters saying, bye now.